Is this thing on? is arguably the central theme of the Twin Peaks universe. We see idyllic characters and settings that are honest and true, soaked in Norman Rockwell-esque Americana. On the flip side, there are seedy counterparts with an underbelly of often intangible malice and dread. This dichotomy is perhaps best represented in the opening sequence of David Lynch's Blue Velvet, the precursor to Twin Peaks, depicting the perfect American town with the perfect American lawn, then revealing the darkness and violence that dwells just below the surface. And like Blue Velvet, Twin Peaks also includes traditional good and evil archetypes. The hero Dale Cooper and the fallen Wyndham Earl, the loving father Doc Hayward and the villainous Ben Horn, the lawful sheriff station and the lawless one-eyed Jax. This episode explores the town of Twin Peaks, its key players, and their shared history. It's worth keeping in mind that Twin Peaks came about in the 1980s era of network nighttime dramas. Cup of coffee. Though the show seems self-aware at times, featuring the faux soap opera Invitation to Love, the original series still showcases traditional romantic drama tropes, including an overabundance of love triangles. It's about the future now, Ed, and what we're gonna do about it. The most definitive example of romantic drama is undoubtedly the tale of the star-crossed lovers, Big Ed Hurley and Norma Jennings. Ed and Norma are Twin Peaks' blue-collar business owners, with Ed running Big Ed's gas farm and Norma being owner-operator of the Double R Diner. Perhaps the most famous location and setting, the Double R exemplifies the good side of Twin Peaks a central location for our heroes that is a source of warmth and comfort delivered in the forms of pie and coffee. In addition to making the best cherry pie in the Tri-Counties, Hot damn, that pie's good! Norma Jennings is seen as a motherly figure and confidant to her troubled employees, Shelly Johnson. I've got one man too many in my life, and I'm married to him. And Annie Blackburn, Norma's sister. Chickadee on a Dodge Dart. Ed and Norma are the classic high school sweethearts, destined to be together and are still madly in love with each other, but youthful mistakes and bad luck have left Norma married to ex-con Hank Jennings and Ed married to the eccentric Nadine. You waiting for those drapes to hang themselves? You okay? Introduced in the 1990 pilot episode and left hanging in the cliffhanger series finale, the often cliched but sentimental and honest romance explores longing, regret, passion, and humanity. I want to be with you. I want to be with you no matter what happens. Leaving the audience perpetually wondering, will love conquer all? The town of Twin Peaks, with a varying population depending on the source, is a small logging town nestled between the Whitetail and Blue Pine Mountains in northeastern Washington state. Twin Peaks came into prosperity in the late 19th century, and like most small American towns, there are a handful of important people who are involved in local politics and oversee the general welfare. The obstinate mayor, Dwayne Milford. Anybody that moves along, bless her in the kingdom come. The trustworthy and dedicated hero of the original series, Sheriff Harry S. Truman. The kind-hearted Doc Hayward, town doctor and father of Donna Hayward. And spiritual guru and local oddball Dr. Lawrence Jacoby. Hang loose, Hollies. The psychiatrist with questionable ethics. And the hippie too. The real power players in the local economy, however, are the Horn family and the Packard clan respectively headed by Benjamin Horn and Catherine Packard Martell. The two prominent families established themselves early in the town's history and have had mutual business dealings for almost just as long. In 1905, Orville Horn arrived from San Francisco and quickly established a successful general store. After a mysterious fire vanquished their competition, 
The family expanded and reopened as Horn's department store in the 1920s and built the famous Great Northern Hotel shortly after. Sometimes the urge to do bad is nearly overpowering. In 1989, Benjamin Horn leads the Horn family and runs its businesses with his food-obsessed brother, Jerry. I want to cook for you. Off the books, Ben and Jerry also own the notorious One-Eyed Jacks, a casino and brothel on the Canadian side of the border, and are involved in various other criminal endeavors. What are you trying to do to this family? Ben is married to Sylvia, and they have two children, the developmentally challenged Johnny and the lovely but instigative Audrey. Audrey Horn is often considered the poster child of Twin Peaks. Got it? With her sway dancing to weird jazz and her puppy love crush on Agent Cooper, Audrey's beauty, provocative attitude, and fashion sense aesthetically define the original series to a T. I'm Audrey Horn and I get what I want. Her relationship with her father is tempestuous at best, and her desire to help Agent Cooper solve Laura Palmer's murder leads Audrey to discover that her father is in fact the owner of the CD One-Eyed Jacks, endangering her own life in the process. According to the access guide to the town, the horns broke ground on the Great Northern in 1927, though visual evidence in the series implies that it was sometime in the 1950s. The hotel features the Timber Room, a full-service restaurant, as well as 102 personalized rooms with wood paneling of ponderosa pine from the Packard Mill. Set atop Whitetail Falls, the iconic landmark is often seen as the centerpiece of the original series, facilitating major plot developments in innumerable congregations, delegations, and world travelers. The Great Northern is also Agent Cooper's home away from home, whose first cup of coffee in episode one is bookended with his doppelganger reveal in the series finale. Leland Palmer's realization of Laura's death in the pilot, Cooper's gunshot wound and visit from the giant in the season two opener, Mike's attempt to sniff out Bob, and the unexplainable death of Josie Packard all take place at the Great Northern. Like the Great Northern, the Packard Mill is another icon of the Twin Peaks community, being its largest employer and the driving force of the local economy. In the late 1800s, the burgeoning town mainly consisted of a trading post and an untidy collection of refugees, trappers, and thieves, until James Packard arrived from Boston in 1890. The secret history novel further explains that the Packard Timber Company and the subsequent Packard Mill became the economic engine for the town of Twin Peaks. Decades later, the mill and the local economy continued to thrive under the direction of James Packard's grandchildren, Andrew and Catherine, who outgrew competition and solidified their empire, with Andrew being the friendly public face and Catherine serving as the hammer of the Packard Timber Company. You're fired. In 1958, Catherine Packard married the lovable but bumbling Pete Martell. There was a fish in the percolator. Descendant of the French fur trapping and rival logging family who settled in the area before the Packards, thus ending a multi-generational family feud. She was plain hell to live with. Though Catherine and Pete's marriage remained tumultuous, they amicably shared residence with Brother Andrew at the Blue Pine Lodge on the shores of Black Lake, near the mill, for over 30 years. In the original series, Catherine Packard Martell is the de facto leader of the Packard clan after the supposed recent death of her brother Andrew in a boating accident. As the nighttime drama of Twin Peaks unfolds, we learn that Catherine is in a power struggle with Andrew's young widow, Josie, and that Catherine has been having a decades-long affair with Benjamin Horn, and that Ben and Josie are both scheming to seize the mill and its land for themselves. All three parties continue to double and triple cross each other throughout the entirety of the original show run, resulting in a dizzying number of plot twists, including Andrew Packard's return from the grave. Insurance investigators should read arson. Block letters about uh, six feet high. The future of the Packard clan is ultimately doomed, however, as the Packard mill is set ablaze by Ben Horn via Leo Johnson in the first season finale. The battle for the land continues into the second season and is left unresolved at the end of the original series, though the secret history explains that Catherine did eventually sell to Ben Horn, effectively ending the Packard dynasty. Another unsolved mystery in Twin Peaks is the story of the beautiful but deadly Jocelyn Josie Packard. 
At age 70, Andrew Packard had married Josie in her 20s and had named her sole beneficiary of the mill and assorted businesses in lieu of sister Catherine. Josie's involvement with Andrew's supposed death, her secret relationship with Sheriff Truman, the international espionage involving her former employer, Thomas Eckhart, the power struggle for the mill and its land, and the reveal that she was, in fact, Agent Cooper's assailant, make her the quintessential example of a soap opera character in Twin Peaks. It's perhaps ironic that we never get to know the true story of the Black Widow Josie, despite her screen time, as her name, age, and entire history appear to be fraudulent, according to Cooper's dossier. In the second season, Josie is ensnared in her own web of deceit, while Andrew, Catherine, Eckhart, Sheriff Truman, and the FBI descend on her at once. After killing Thomas Eckhart at the Great Northern Hotel, Josie dies from what can possibly be described as a fear-induced heart attack. As she dies, Agent Cooper witnesses Bob and the arm, shortly before we see that her ghost, or presence, is seemingly trapped in a wooden drawer pole. Another riddle was introduced into the show. What happened to Josie? And the questions surrounding Josie's entrapment begat the thesis of what some call wood theory. Wood theory supposes that Josie is held captive in the wood of the Great Northern, which holds some sort of ancient magic sourced from the old growth forest surrounding Twin Peaks. Supporting evidence was found in the Access Guide, published in 1991, which shows that in addition to the ponderosa pine wood paneling of the hotel itself, the possibly enchanted wood cub carried by the log lady is also ponderosa pine, arguably suggesting a link, thus making the wood paneling of the hotel potentially enchanted as well. Whether a direct function of the wood itself or not, evidence in the show has led many to believe that Josie's fear opened a door for Bob to take her to the Black Lodge. Her face appearing in the drawer pole and the fact that her autopsy revealed her body to weigh 25 pounds less than it should. How's that possible? Suggests that a part of Josie became trapped along the way and now inhabits the Great Northern. A scene in episode 27 hints that this was a potential direction the show was taking as Ben Horn is startled by the mysterious hum heard at Josie's death. We then immediately cut to Pete Martell at the wooden mantle in the Great Northern Lobby, waxing poetic while lamenting his dear friend. Josie, I see your face. Behind the scenes discussions and photo evidence surfaced in the years after the show's cancellation, suggesting that Josie was originally to appear hanging halfway in and out of the red drapes in the series finale when Cooper enters the Black Lodge. This also points to the idea that Josie is in some sort of spiritual limbo, trapped between the Black Lodge and the Great Northern Hotel. In the traditional sense of good and evil archetypes, the Twin Peaks Sheriff's Department are the good guys in this television drama. Sheriff Harry S. Truman, Deputy Tommy Hawk Hill, Deputy Andy Brennan, and receptionist Lucy Moran are the honest and true heroes of the original series, fighting to protect Twin Peaks in the American way from the forces of evil. They are the upstanding public servants seen through an idyllic 1950s lens, who assist another lawman, the FBI's Dale Cooper, with the town-shaking case of who killed Laura Palmer. Not a word about this to anyone to hear from me. The calm and measured Harry Truman has successfully kept the peace in the town of Twin Peaks up until this point, but the town seems to now be coming apart at the seams, and he is happy to have Dale Cooper's direction and assistance. We're glad to have you here. While solving the Laura Palmer case and various other adventures, Truman and Cooper's mutual respect and admiration grows into an enduring friendship. Though at times he may be playing second fiddle to Cooper, because I'm beginning to feel a bit like Dr. Watson. Sheriff Truman is no spring chicken with little patience for nonsense. Bobby Briggs, Buttman. And asserts himself when necessary. <laughs> the tough but kind rock of Twin Peaks, Harry Truman is also very much a human being, temperamental and subject to heartbreak. But only one in the cycle of life can fill your heart with wonder and the wisdom that you have known a singular joy. I wrote that for my girlfriend. The tracker and sage, Deputy Hawk Hill, also stands beside Truman in the pursuit of truth and the thwarting of evil. 
Anyone can find him, Hawk can. Time and again, Hawk's bravery and razor-sharp wit proved to be indispensable assets to the sheriff's station. You're on the path. You don't need to know where it leads. Just follow. And his Native American heritage provides spiritual insight into Cooper's understanding of the Black Lodge. If you confront the Black Lodge with imperfect courage, it will utterly annihilate your soul. The team would not be complete without the pure hearts of gold found in Deputy Andy Brennan and receptionist Lucy Moran. The slow but courageous Andy is perhaps best known for his overly sensitive side, which helps emotionally ground the story, serving as a consistent reminder to the audience of the true horror and sadness at play. It's so horrible. Andy. Like Deputy Andy, the lovable Lucy Moran isn't the sharpest tool in the shed, though evidence suggests that she knows more than she lets on. Her relationship with Andy and unfettered honesty supply often needed comic relief and relatability to the show. What? The lovebirds have their ups and downs. I'm pregnant. But the two stalwarts prove that indeed the simplest of us contain an abundance of love and inner courage. Our heroes frequently convene in the conference room, the central hub of the sheriff's station. Continually stocked with donuts and coffee, the conference room table also plays host to such evidence as Laura Palmer's diaries, videotapes, boxes of Flesh World magazine, a bloody towel, a bonsai tree, and of course, a small box of chocolate buddies. Guests include our favorite minor bird, Waldo, Judge Clinton Sternwood, visiting FBI agents, and whatever teenager needs to be questioned at the time. The conference room is also where our heroes ponder, reflect, and sometimes literally find direction. The blackboard serves as the primary visual aid, used multiple times by Cooper while on the path to finding Bob. At the beginning of the second season, we see a map of Twin Peaks on the big board, while later it is adorned with the mysterious petroglyph from the Wall of Owl Cave, which is ultimately revealed by Andy to be the map to the Black Lodge. It's not a puzzle at all. It's a map. Behind the Sheriff's Department is another force of good existing off the books, as it were. A secret society. When certain across-the-border shenanigans fall outside of legal jurisdiction, the Bookhouse Boys are set to rise to the occasion. Somebody's got to watch my back. Already got it covered. Harry Truman, Hawk Hill, Big Ed Hurley with his nephew James and friends carry the mantle as the third generation of this group of concerned citizens. Agent Cooper becomes first involved early in the original series, being looped in by Truman to assist in their drug running investigation, and later calls on their help to rescue Audrey from One-Eyed Jacks. Cooper is then officially inducted, a privilege that renders him speechless. I am honored beyond my ability to express myself. Adding to their mystique, the Bookhouse Boys, like Cooper, acknowledge other forces in the world. I call it what you want, a uh, darkness, a presence and believe that something exists deep in the woods. There's a sort of evil out there. According to the secret history novel, the book house is an old one-room schoolhouse on Highway 21, serving as such until 1918, when it became a lending library and subsequent local hangout and coffee shop. In 1941, under the looming threat of World War II, a citizen's brigade was formed under the leadership of Frederick Truman sheriff and father of future sheriffs, Harry and Frank Truman. With justice and literacy being its twin ideals and the bookhouse set as its meeting place, the brigade and its tradition of community service passed into local lore as the Bookhouse Boys. Its second generation roster featured the 1968 Twin Peaks High School seven-man football squad starting lineup. Harry and Frank Truman, Ed Hurley, Hawk Hill, Thadalonius, Toad, Barker, and future criminals Hank Jennings and Jerry Horn. The journaled history and legends of Twin Peaks are held in the bookhouse. Oh, what a tangled web by Robert Jacoby, detailing the history of the town and its prominent families. The Andrew Packard case, chronicling the escapades of the late Josie Packard, submitted by Special Agent Dale Cooper. The Ballad of Big Ed and Norma and Nadine, a tale of bad luck and enduring love by Hawk Hill and The Eye of God, Sacred Psychology in the Aboriginal Mind by Dr. Lawrence Jacoby, a window into the mind of the town's off-center psychiatrist. While the Bookhouse Boys remain local legends, the lending library of the old schoolhouse continues to be open to the public.
When this kind of fire starts, it is very hard to put out. The tender boughs of innocence burn first, and the wind rises, and then all goodness is in jeopardy. While the idyllic town of Twin Peaks is forever in conflict with the evil in the woods, there are shining lights that help guide us through the darkness. Margaret Lanterman, known as the Log Lady, is one of these lights. Introduced as a quirky element of the 1990 pilot, Who's the lady with the log? We call her the Log Lady. The Log Lady became instantly popular, and over time has come to define Twin Peaks and embody its mysteries. In the original series, Margaret is, of course, the local woman who carries a log around with her and is even more socially awkward when it comes to chewing gum. She is, however, revealed to be something of a seer, a provider of cryptic clues from speaking to her log that help guide our heroes to the killer of Laura Palmer. My log saw something that night. The Secret Diary of Laura Palmer novel expands upon her role as the town mystic, and as the television series progresses, it is learned that the log lady has even more connections to the supernatural elements, sharing post-abduction scars with Major Briggs and providing a final clue for Agent Cooper before his confrontation with the Black Lodge. This oil is an opening to a gateway. In Fire Walk With Me and Its Missing Pieces, Margaret attempts to guide Laura Palmer and is later seen reacting on the night of Laura's murder. After the show's cancellation and release of the feature film, the Bravo Network re-ran Twin Peaks in 1993, including new episode introductions by The Log Lady, written and directed by David Lynch. Welcome to Twin Peaks. My name is Margaret Lanterman. These Log Lady introductions have been featured on the DVD and Blu-ray releases and have since unquestionably solidified The Log Lady's legacy. My log hears things I cannot hear. As she is the literal guide to each episode, is life like a game of chess? Introducing the themes. A death mask. The heart. Pie. And enhancing the mysteries. A circle of pain. A circle of suffering. Woe to the ones who behold the pale horse. In homage to real life actress and longtime Lynch collaborator Catherine Coulson, Margaret Maggie Coulson, age seven, was one of three children who vanished in the woods during a school nature walk. Maggie was found the next day in a state of confusion with a mysterious mark on the back of her right knee. After the abduction, Maggie became quieter, not as playful, and more internal. Always watching and remaining fixed on the outside world, she grew up with an ecological consciousness, studied at Washington State, and hoped to work for the U.S. Forestry Service. While working at the town library, Margaret Coulson met Sam Lanterman. Ten years older than Margaret, six foot five, 240 pounds with chiseled features and a beard, Sam was a third generation woodsman, the volunteer fire chief, and the first, last, and only love of Margaret's life. On their wedding night, lightning started a fire in which Sam was the only casualty, taken from a ridge in a funnel cloud of flame and into a burning ravine. Margaret journeyed to the heart of the forest, the place of their wedding engagement near Glastonbury Grove. Though ravaged by fire, the sycamore still stood while an old growth Douglas fir had fallen. Margaret returned to town with a piece of that Douglas fir and they have been inseparable ever since. The extent of the magic within Margaret Lanterman's log remains unexplained, another great mystery of Twin Peaks. It's interesting to note that the entry in the 2016 Secret History novel contradicts the 1991 access guide to the town, which claims that Margaret's log is of ponderosa pine, not the aforementioned Douglas fir. Depending on your viewpoint and timelines notwithstanding, a Douglas fir wood cub arguably severs the connection of the ponderosa pine wood paneling of the Great Northern to Margaret's log, and thus weakening supporting evidence of so-called wood theory. I grew up in the woods. I understand many things because of the woods. However, the pervasive theme of the reverence of nature in Twin Peaks. What kind of fantastic trees have you got growing around here? Especially the Douglas fir trees 
make it impossible to completely discount the idea that their lumber holds some sort of ancient power, especially Margaret's log. Deliver the message. Regardless of whatever magic the log holds, it is Margaret herself that is truly powerful. As the stories of star-crossed lovers, protectors, and politicians transpire in Twin Peaks, Margaret Lannerman continues to minister to the sick and the sick at heart while maintaining her spiritual connection to nature and to her log, through which she is a medium of some greater unexplainable force. There are many stories in Twin Peaks. Some of them are sad, some funny. Some are stories of madness, of violence. Some are ordinary, yet they all have about them a sense of mystery. Margaret's words serve as a guide, aiding viewers on the journey through the darkness cryptic, comforting, and preparing us for the inevitable things to come.